Okay. Um, before we get going, though, I, I do want to thank Ori Inbar because he's, he really has put together a rock star group today. I think we really need to give him a round of applause. <laughs> One of the, the big things with uh, augmentedreality.org is that the whole purpose of it is to educate, connect, and hatch. And um, one of the things that I do is I, I'm a founder of a, uh, something called Augmented Reality Dirt. And it's a podcast that is really the only podcast out there on augmented reality. And what I've tried to accomplish with my, my co-host, Bobby Simpson, who I think is uh, showing up late, is we're trying to connect all of the different augmented reality and augmented world people together under one roof. So we have awesome meetups like AR Barcelona, AR Detroit, AR Chicago, who Patrick O'Shaughnessy is a member of, and trying to bring all of these people together and get this information out there. So I, I just wanted to kind of mention that. I'm also a police officer. Um, anything I say does not represent my police department. So I want to tell you that, okay? <laughs> what we're gonna be talking about is AR and the impact on society. We've already heard a lot about that throughout the day, but I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have very distinguished guests. We have Dr. Stephen Feiner, who uh, from Columbia University, who has been working on AR for a very long time, and uh, I consider him to be one of the godfathers of AR. So uh, he, he really is an award-winning scientist. He actually created the first outdoor mobile augmented reality system, and that was back in 1996. And how many pounds did it weigh? 45. 45 pounds. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and then obviously Blair McIntyre here also um, uh, working with Dr. Finer, but we, we have an in incredible group. The next panelist is John C. Havens, who uh, just came out with a book called Hacking Happiness. Uh, John is a contributing writer for, uh, I'm sure you've heard of Mashable, The Guardian, The Huffington Post. Uh, he also uh, is really a, a killer harmonica player, but we're not going to have him play today. But John has an incredible insight on big data, and Ken, I don't want you to shoot me when I say that, but uh, <laughs> he really has an, an awesome perspective on that, and I think that ties into really the internet of things and kind of where we're moving. Our next person is Track Lord, which you've already um, heard from Track. He's a really energetic, uh, charismatic person who truly has traveled all over the world, uh, you know, representing Matayo and, uh, you know, enough said about track. He just really is uh, a very intelligent guy, and we're going to look forward to getting his perspective on where he sees AR and uh, the augmented world moving forward. And finally, you, you heard from uh, Dr. Uh, Ken Perlin, and uh, we're going we're gonna to get into his mind, too, and just, you know, he has some really interesting things to say more beyond what you've already heard, kind of on where AR is taking us and how that's going to influence us. So I first want to kind of start off with uh, how we're going to do it is I'd like each panelist to, and we'll start off with Dr. Finer, Steve, Steve, who will basically uh, just start off for about three minutes just talking about where you've come with AR and kind of what, what's the biggest thing you want to really talk about today with the future of AR. Ah, that's a very, very big question to try to answer. Um, as I think uh, uh, Joe has mentioned, I've been doing AR for quite a, a long time. Started in 1990, uh, with indoor things, with little tiny displays that we had to partially manufacture ourselves, um, all the way through uh, head-worn displays outside with 45 pounds worth of backpack, uh, through things that were more like uh, handheld tablet, pre-tablet PC devices, uh, some of the first generations of smartphones. And nowadays, never, never really stopped using head-worn displays, it being very, very dear to me that that's really the way things are gonna go prior to the implants and genetic modifications of some distant future. Uh, it's just very gratifying right now for me to see them actually coming back into fashion, so to speak, again, and being something that people actually talk about and try to build commodity versions of. So a lot of what I'm interested in is not just the hardware, I don't really do optic design. I don't really build uh, low-level hardware. I've done things that have required a little bit of those skills just to be able to make stuff when stuff wasn't available. But my main interest as a researcher is in user interfaces, is in the software infrastructure um, that underlies AR experiences. And how do we make systems that actually work well from the standpoint of a person 
in terms of how you interact with them. Uh, there's a term that I've uh, been using for quite a while, uh, environment management. Um, the idea of being able to actually make experiences that are not just things that live on the featureless black rectangle in front of you, whether it's a big screen, a really, really big wall size screen, a little tiny smartphone screen in which you, the designer, owns every single pixel. And either it's as black as the manufacturer can make it or it's filled with vibrant color. I'm much more interested in when I'm looking around and I don't own every pixel. This real stuff out there that I choose not to ignore. This is not VR, this is augmented reality. And therefore you need to make experiences that respect and pay attention to the stuff that's actually around you. And that means you need to ideally, unless you know about things in advance and no one's really good at predicting, you need to on the fly sense what's happening out there through a variety of different means and then make augmentations that react to, that pay attention to, that work well with the real stuff that's happening. And I think that's one of the things about AR that makes it especially challenging. We're not just looking at a fait accompli, um, we are controlling a small portion of what it is that you're gonna see. There's a lot of real stuff that's out there that we need to interact with. We have to not block things that are really important and we may want to actually block things that we think are as being less important. So that notion of making virtual things that naturally uh, weaved or woven into the real world experience and that makes sense in terms of the real things that are happening out there that keep you from getting run over when you're trying to cross the street by not having you know, a big advertisement in your face as the car bears down on you. I mean, that's, I think, one of the things that's gonna be really, really important and one of the things that I try to work on in little ways in my lab. Great. John? Uh, where's Blair McIntyre? Hey, Blair. Um, I, thank you in the sense of it was about four years ago, someone, I think I was at a meeting at, like at Walmart, I used to work in PR, and someone showed me, hey, this is augmented reality. It was like a Pong game, and I was like, I could care less, I didn't know what it was. And then I saw your AR shooter, that amazing video with the, uh, the, the, the yeah, the zombies getting shot, and you put the skittle in the middle. And uh, that video blew my mind in the sense of I said, this is not about, uh, I mean, uh, games are great, uh, but I said, this is, someone told me the term outer net, and I said, this is not the internet, this is the outer net. And uh, I, I salute everyone that I'm sitting here with. I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy in the sense of I don't make this stuff, I dream about it and write about it. And one area I'm particularly interested in is what I call virtual air rights and uh, aspects of um, the ownership of the data that is involved in what you see. And in terms of the book I just wrote is uh, I'm also interested in our identity and how that's broadcast via what I think is inevitable. Again, by the people, I worship you again, uh, who are creating this stuff. And whether it's 10 years or 15 years, um, how this will look right now, this experience, if we choose to be in meat space, I think it's gonna be very interesting in terms of how much of your identity is going to be controlled by you, how much is going to be controlled by the bias of whatever you're wearing, let alone the fact that through net neutrality, you know, if you're an AT&T person and I'm on Verizon, will I even see you, right? Um, that's a thought I had. And um, my, uh, that's most of my focus in terms of the identity. There's one other thing I was going to say. I think, um, oh, I have a buddy who's working at a company called APX Labs, and they've already done, I think, quite a bit of work on augmented uh, contact lenses. They also do military applications where they have biometric data that can be read while you're wearing your contact lens. So you can look at someone else, and through the color of their face, uh, the blood that goes to their face, you can actually tell about their biometric data, so their heart rate, et cetera. I think that's fascinating, and I think that means from, what I'm really interested in is the ethics and the cultural aspect of what it means when I can look around this room and not just see you know, your LinkedIn contact or recent data, but know like when you might be about to have a heart attack or you know, if I can see by the color of your heart rate, am I boring you now, and like that type of stuff. I think that's gonna be really fascinating and I, I would love to have conversations about the ethics of things like artificial intelligence. Um, just because all this great technology, that the fact that we can make it, um, A, I don't think it means that we should without thinking about the ramifications for, like I love what Ken said in terms of the drawing in space and all that. It's great that our kids will find this normal when they grow up, but just to be able to talk about aspects of humanity now before we move on too, too far into it. Hi. Hi. Uh, 
Hi. Uh, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Track. I'm the head of marketing for Matayo. Um, I do not have a doctorate. I've never written a book, and I can't play a musical instrument to save my life. <laughs> so I, it's funny that John says that, because I actually find myself having a lot of trouble understanding why I'm sitting here at the moment, uh, because I feel in the, in the wake of this, I haven't really contributed much um, to the technology, to the history. All I can really say is that uh, about three years ago, um, I don't know if any of you know my colleague, Brendan, who also uh, is now based out of New York, who also works for Matayo. We were actually roommates in college. And uh, one day he came up to me and, and uh, I think I was, I don't know, I was doing something. I was being pensive and smoking cigarettes or something. He walks up to me and he says, track, augmented reality. I said, I don't really want to talk about last night. You know, just, you know, said, no, no, no. It's this new technology. You have to check it out. And he was showing me these uh, flash animations that he was working on where you were tracking a, a, an ID marker and, and he was doing all these crazy visualizations. And, I thought, this is, this is amazing. Um, and I was fortunate enough to then uh, join Matayo uh, a year or so later. And since then, uh, my primary focus is sort of, as, as Joe said, but without you know, lavishing uh, so much flattery upon myself, uh, going around and, and informing people kind of the value of the technology. Um, and not just uh, in order to you know, sell software, but also just to make people understand that Augmented reality is far more than just a, a bunny rabbit popping out of the cover of a newspaper. It's, uh, it's a way of, of being able to access all of that information and connecting the digital and the real world. Um, I still, to this day, am, uh, to some degree, in the back of my mind, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a crossword puzzle enthusiast, so every time I'm in a Starbucks, high five, yeah. Every time I'm in a Starbucks uh, and, you know, there's a copy of the New York Times, I, I grab the puzzle, but I find myself thinking, as I'm scanning the articles, cannot believe that we have these 2D interfaces that are in no way connected to information. And it's not, you know, by Dana of being sort of like spoiled or living in a tech bubble. It's the fact that if I go to the New York Times website and I'm reading an article, I'm like a mouse click away from finding more information, video content, images, all sorts of stuff. But yet we still have this kind of like almost obsolete unconnected material where you can't do that. And uh, before sort of augmented reality, the only thing that you could really do was then look up the website on your mobile phone and then find the article and, and do everything else. But um, it, uh, it baffles me that we still sort of live in this age when we can't connect that wealth of uh, uh, large amounts of information uh, <laughs> to, the, uh, to these things that we interact with on a regular, on a regular basis. And that's one of the th reasons I... I really like Matayo because, and, and just the technology, because it's kind of the vision that at some point in the very near future, uh, we will be able to access information from almost anything. You know, it's, it's, and it sort of goes back, uh, my history is kind of in, in writing and communications and the, the concept that everything has a story and not necessarily a narrative, but everything has a reason for existing, right? And to be able to actually access that, that information is not a novelty. It's a, it's a value, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to that day when it transpires. Yes. Track, I, I just was going to say, um, you know, Track is, is being very humble up here because after interviewing Track and talking to him many different times, he'll say to me, Joe, I work for, like, just this amazing um, company. I have access to all of this, these most amazing R&D people, and if you, as you listen to Track talk about Matayo and talk about augmented reality, you know every intricacy of, of AR, so uh, he's very humbling in his, uh, some of what he's saying up there. I mean, uh, his insight is, is really amazing, so I just want to mention that, but all right, Ken, you're up next. I like that when I do the Saturday Crosser puzzle on paper, I can't cheat. <laughs> it's really good, you know, it's important. I see it as a learning experience. Yeah, okay. You know, oh, okay, answer, okay, you know. fine, yeah, all right, fine. Okay. You do it in pen? Yeah. Nice, I find it. <laughs> How many people do the New York Times Crosser puzzle? Yeah, there you go. We all got to meet up and have a drink afterwards. And do crossword puzzles together. Do cross, that's right, because we're very cool. <laughs> um, um, so, all right, um, there's a reason that I showed past technologies and past content that came from them. Two examples I gave were books and um, movies, um, because if you think of printing technology, many, many, many things could have happened once we had printing, but we got the novel. 
Um, and many things could have happened from Edison's invention. But then all of these content inventions, which were not technical inventions, they were inventions of this is what works for people, uh, montage, mise-en-scene, you know, various kinds of camera tricks and, and, and focal, focal tricks that you see every day, whether or not you know it, they're the reasons that you're being emotionally attached to one character versus another on either a movie or The Sopranos. And what's interesting about this is that what it all says and why it's important for AR is that so what's not going to change maybe for hundreds of years, if ever, is this. Our brains aren't going to change. We have no idea what the hell's going on in there. I mean, people work really hard, and maybe except for Ray Kurzweil, no one else <laughs> has any clue. I mean, there are people who spend their entire lives, and it's a big mystery how we do what we do, which means with all the technology changing around us, and, and, and some, some of them go through their exponential phase and it gets really exciting, then they level off. Um, the brain is the same as the brain of the Cro-Magnon 30,000 years ago. We're not any different, which means we're basically building all this stuff around an incredibly amazing fixed point. And that means that every time you throw another enabling technology in the ring, be it um, printing on books or be it um, being able to put sequential images together 24 times a second, or be it, oh, I can make any object appear, you're not going to get just anything. You know, for the web, you got Facebook. You sort of got MySpace, then it went away. You got Twitter. You didn't get other things. And because collectively, all those brains converged on what humans do with whatever you have. So the very exciting process of discovery is culture is going to take whatever we do, and 90% of what, or more, of what people in this room try is not going to stick when you throw it against the wall. But then the things that do are going to become the phenomena like Facebook and like Twitter. And I think we all know this, but I think as we try to explore what those things are that take off because they're what people really embrace, as opposed to what's temporarily cool and then everyone forgets it like five years later, um, we should remember that the target is the collective minds of people. And that has to be respected because you're not going to be changing that anytime soon. And so you have to pay a lot of attention to what's going on with not with your bits and bytes and electronics and this, but with the minds and the hearts of people. You know, people look at the internet as the collective consciousness, <clears throat> and is that the next step when AR and an augmented world tr truly kicks in, we, we have that collective con consciousness that is, is pure and that's out there? Oh, well, what, do you, what do you mean by pure? To, to, I mean, yeah. I, what I'm saying is, is that it just came out that uh, President Obama is looking to turn over the internet to an international community. Uh, President Bill Clinton, former President Bill Clinton yesterday, said that he was against that. He thinks the U.S. should maintain that. We talk about big data, and uh, a question came uh, by a gentleman earlier that Google c controls these data sets, and, and John just brought up the fact that how this data is controlled and, and that sort of thing. So I, I guess what I'm, I'm kind of looking at is as we look at big data and how, it, how it's moving, it, it truly becomes a collective consciousness. And is AR that, that vehicle that's going to bring us there? I, yeah, I, I see AR as being a way to experience, um, as being a way to, through some of the sensors that you're using, also track and uh, sense things that are around you. Um, and as lots and lots of people use it to be able to go and build up lots and lots of data and also provide to someone who's using it the ability to see information. But I guess I don't really see it as being a replacement for the web or, I mean, the web is, is data, right? Lots, big data, oops. <laughs> And the web isn't censoring. Right. I mean, there, um, there are so the, right, things. the web is a censor because in part there are people tipping, typing away at their keyboards. And now, and there are also people walking around with their smartphones, right, whose information is being put out on the web. And there will be people walking around with things that are going to be wearables on wrists, wearables on heads, uh, looking at stuff that now can be seen in, in different contexts than it would otherwise be. And I guess I don't see that as being a game changer in terms of the basic low level stuff. I see it maybe more in terms of when you get to go and do things. The difference between, for example, knowing that maybe before you meet somebody, you Google them. Nowadays, that's considered perfectly normal and non-spooky. On the other hand, if I meet you and I suddenly whip out my phone like, and start looking you up, that's awkward. 
But on the other hand, if when I meet you, because I'm wearing something, and because you want me to find out stuff about you, I can simply look at you, I can see around you the same way that you would have a, a separate Facebook page or a separate web page, I can see around you all of this informational dust that basically gives me information, it gives me things that I want to know, tells me it's your birthday because you're wearing a little birthday hat, and if I don't see that, then I'm probably not gonna say happy birthday and I'll be considered to be really rude because everybody sees that, right? Right, meet someone in a bar, see their arrest record, ask them out. <laughs> there are some people for whom that would be a plus, I would think, right? And other people for whom it wouldn't, Nothing but, wrong you know, no, it's the same information. It doesn't magically come out there because of AR. On the other hand, it might magically be able to get to you much sooner than it normally would, courtesy of AR. So maybe you don't get sweet talk by the person at the bar because you instantly know that they have the arrest record rather than finding out too late. So it's actually hard for me to envision <clears throat> And I, we, 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 I say we, like a royal kind of we, feel like I've heard this a couple times today, but this idea, actually you mentioned in your presentation too, this idea that we're all gonna be seeing the same content. Oh, not the same. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Oh, not no, I meant that we can see the same. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean we certainly will see the same. But Sorry. even, yeah, but yeah. It, even then, I guess it's, it might just be because of perspective, but the, maybe it's just because we all live in this kind of like these, we live in boxes right now. You know, we live in boxes, this kind of app economy that constrains us to, if we want to use something, it has to be inside, kind of like this, uh, I don't know how to describe it necessarily, but that's a huge contrast to the internet, right? Because mm -hmm. the internet is accessible mm -hmm. from a bunch of you know, uh, proprietary things, like you know, the browsers, but you can access, for the, for the most part, all the same content. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really not, that's not there right now in, in, in augmented reality. And I feel like I, I have trouble thinking beyond that because it's just, you know, if you have all you, if you have a hammer, the only thing you see is nails. But I do, I think that's actually gonna be the internet that brings augmented reality to a more uh, uh, ubiquitous state. Mm -hmm. I would really like to see more uh, investment in the mobile web. Mm -hmm. Like let's take the mobile web and let's start trying to figure out how to access camera APIs so that we can actually start opening up augmented reality experiences and then those augmented reality experiences that can use. Just, just so you know, all day, Blair has been programming that sitting next to me. That's awesome. Just, he has been, I've been watching him, it's amazing. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's fantastic, it honestly is. Mm -hmm. um, Let's give him a hand, he's actually sure. been programming. <laughs> he's been working. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I, I, I would really like to see that happen and then I think that will still allow these kind of because like the, the core of augmented reality is really all this proprietary technology that lives in, at least on, on the non-academic side, like in, in all of these companies that are here, like Matayo, Daiquiri, Blipar, Layer, et cetera. Um, that's really like, that's, that's the foundation of all these companies, right, is their technology. And I think the mobile web could allow us to sort of break outside of uh, the, the application dynamic and get into an area where that proprietary technology can still be utilized, but through a portal that every single person that uses technology right now can access. I think yeah. that really oh, is, I mean, the, the goal is not to have lots of little providers that are completely, totally separate any more than it is on the web itself. Yeah. And also not to have that uniform experience that everyone gets because, you know, it's very hard to enforce uniform experiences, right? And even right now, you know, you use even the same search engine that I use. It's really not. What your experience using Google is not my experience using Google, for example. It's true. Independent of whether we're even logged in. Because you're coming in from one particular IP address. I'm coming in from another IP address. And, you know, Google knows something about where we are and what stuff got done on that before. So it's like all over in terms of wanting to be anonymous, right? But it also means that you can have things that are customized and, and crafted just for you. And that's... That's very exciting and a little scary because it means that you can, you're, what you see and what you hear, especially if you're listening to things that are very well known, very popular, very big, you know, you can have certain amounts of censorship basically, whether or not you call it that. Could I, could I actually sure. jump in there and expand sure. on that? Because this actually came up from some research that um, 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 came out of our lab and we were actually concerned about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we got a, we got a, a best paper award at, at SIGCHI and we ourselves were like, maybe this isn't cool. Um, it was this work where um, um, you, could, um, you could go around with your iPad and change the physical city landscape around you. 
So you could say, oh, I think I want that building to be smaller, or I want that crooked street to be straight. And of course, it was just with an iPad. It was, but the fundamental underlying technology would certainly um, carry over into wearables when the wearables become widely available at affordable prices. And what we realized was that in a dystopian scenario, we're all walking around in this gleaming, beautiful city and everything's lovely and there's art on the walls. And meanwhile, you know, you don't see the homeless people. You don't see that, you know, there's dirt on the walls. And, you know, you might think that's never going to happen. You know, we'd never let that happen, that we would just always like wear our rose colored um, augmented glasses. At the same time, when was the last time you ever went to a restaurant and had a great meal and then demanded to be taken back to the kitchen so you could find out the truth. Like, ever? Um, so we live in a world where when we can shield ourselves mm -hmm. from unpleasant things, we do. This is the human condition. And so we as the people who are enabling augmented reality, I think what you're saying, see there's, there's, there's some hard questions to ask about yeah. which world are we gonna live in. Yeah, can I add, can I add to that? Like, and by the way, a guy named Jemai Cassio, uh, I would highly recommend you read C.A. SCIO, and I interviewed him about three years ago, and he talked about augmented shopping. Now, by the way, forgive me if I get some of the terms wrong, but I mean, you walk into a store, and you're a fan of Coke. So you walk down the soda aisle, and when you turn your head, and in the real world, there would be Pepsi on the wall, you would see other Coke products, because you just your preference is to not see that. And I think what I'm fascinated by is I think about just like, and I was thinking this in the way here tonight, you know, in this college setting, is the Wi-Fi something where there's, or, and again, so, some of the tech I might get wrong, but is, is the Wi-Fi something where I, there would be some kind of college rules? I actually did a conference here four years ago. You know, Wi-Fi encryption in colleges is different than other institutions. So would I only be allowed to see certain things? So would my vision kind of turn into a college setting? Then I walk to the subway, and if I even get reception in the subway, it's going to be MTA dictated. If I walk by a mailbox, there's RFID and some kind of sensor technology. So in one sense, it's sort of like, am I going to be walking through this sort of odd kind of constantly shifting environment, or will I have a uniform experience, which I think is probably going to be more the case, which is based on my preference. And, and I couldn't agree more. I wrote a short story about this, you know, where a guy is playing a game going through Penn Station, because if you commit in Penn Station, please give us a game to not have to experience that every morning <laughs> where we don't hurt other people. And in this game I uh, wrote for a magazine called Media, uh, this short story, this guy is, is uh, playing a game, he's grabbing at coins, and at one point he sees a bag of something on the ground and he kicks it really hard because it's supposed to be a bag of coins and it turns out he, he's kicking a homeless guy. And he takes his glasses off for the first time in two years and rubs his eyes and he sees that he's broken this guy's nose. And to me, this type of scenario, uh, uh, Maybe I'm dystopian, but I think it's inevitable. And, and again, I'm, again, I'm with the experts who would know, is that even possible in 5, 10, 20 years? But I can't see, if you get a chance to read the book, um, uh, I'm blanking on the title, I'm sure someone here will know it, but I got to interview him as well, about you know, the, the big concern about artificial intelligence in terms of when you do Google searches that you know, your computer and, and cookies to sort of get to know you so that eventually the preferences about who you are and how you search, um, you know, like two people, the two of us could do the exact same searches and say we were both Republican or whatever and lived in the same town. Our searches could look completely different even though we were exactly the same. So the logic is that as our, our, if our lives in, in this realm, the, the, the PC realm and mobile, uh, are sort of c controlled in one sense by the preferences and the AI that sort of dictate our lives. Um, I, again, for me, I just see that being inevitable that that will shift over into the new immersive environments we move into, whatever the, uh, the makeup. I just want to jump in. I, I want to make sure if anybody has any questions to ask the panel, please feel free. Uh, we have a microphone. We could walk over to you. If there's any questions, uh, this is a good opportunity uh, if anybody wants to ask a question. We have four of your gentlemen right over here. He's going to give you the microphone. Uh, Jamai, J-A-M-A-I-S, and his last name is Koskio. I'm, I'm mispronouncing it, C-A-S-C-I-O. I think Steve that, Mann. Thad is involved with Google Glass, and Steve is involved with the company Meta that I'm advising. And, so and there's a number of those people that have, over the years, gotten back into doing things that have to do with eyewear. And in fact, what both Steve and Thad have done 
as the years have gone on is they've kept on the cutting edge of, at first they look like, you know, locutious from Star Trek Next Generation, but then it just kept getting smaller and smaller and sleeker and sleeker. And of course now it's hit this interesting place where there is this very high speed internet and enabling technologies. And so now it's tied in in real time with the world around them. But they've always, all the people who stayed with it um, have kept getting their form factor smaller and smaller and smaller as the years went on. And actually more than that, right? I mean, last week I was walking around uh, the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, and this is my third or fourth year going there, and I was, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but I was, I was very surprised at the amount of companies that just have, that now have immersive VR headsets. You had Sony uh, displaying the Project mm -hmm. Morpheus thing, right. and it's, it's like we're back in 1987. It was, uh, and let's say, like, of course, but everything we're not is, because a lot of those things now actually work. It, no, <laughs> yeah. close, much, much yeah. closer. I and assume it's all relative, right? close. Yes. But it's weird, just you know, you I, I walk around a corner and there's this entire row of people wearing these garish, you know, sleek looking, but still like big, uh, like white, blinky light, uh, opaque displays, and they've got like little like air traffic control batons. And they're playing games and stuff. It comes back every 27 years. <laughs> I'm saying, yeah, yeah. Maybe so it's not kind of locust, right? But what, I'm, what I'm wondering is, uh, is, uh, is still like, and, and actually we had, a, we had a couple partners there that were also uh, debuting kind of these, uh, these like what I call missing link form factors, these wearable things where you slide a phone in and it's side-by-side -side content. <laughs> sort of like these do-it-yourself Oculuses, except they won't be bought by Facebook for $2 billion. Uh, or maybe they will, who knows. <laughs> um, but uh, what happens, because I actually, I actually went to the Stanford uh, VHL recently, and I was doing their virtual uh, phobia training thing where the floor drops out from under you. Um, but I noticed, and not unkindly, they, they told me it was a beta project, but when I looked down at my feet, where my feet were supposed to be, because I was wearing these ankle sensors, um, they were just a little bit to the left. Mm -hmm. So I found myself, you know, like almost falling over a couple times. The woman had to be like, seriously, stop leaning to the left. I'm like, but my feet are over here. But my, I, I can feel them here, but my eyes are saying they're over here. What happens when these people try to not play these things on the couch? You know, I they mean, need they, our, they need our floor mats. They do need the floor mats, actually. Oh mm. wow, I know it all comes together. Yeah. Um, but seriously, like, well, like, you like that's that's a whole other set of technologies, right? You the want really good tracking. You have right. to have it, and you also want really good sensitivity to what's in the environment. Yeah, right. right. But, so that, that's definitely, people in research do things with room size and larger tracking, but to really do that in an environment which you encourage people to do that, yeah. you've got to really know what's in the environment. And the wonderful thing is there's lots of very bright people doing research on what's called SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, mm -hmm. being able to figure out through sensors where you are in a strange, unknown environment, and also at the same time do the mapping, do the building up the model of the environment. And especially if it's an environment that doesn't change that much, like none of the chairs out there are going to move. These ones on stage will. The stage itself is not going to change. If you start with that model of all the things that won't move a lot, and then just do, a, you know, what angle the seats are flipped up, you know, who's on the stage, where the cups are, et cetera, you know, it becomes a whole lot easier. Still a very hard problem. We need and there's lots of folks working on doing that with wearable sensors and environment-based sensors. We also need to train our minds mm -hmm. to uh, essentially ignore all of the real-world sensory feedback, right? Because that's where, the, that's where the conflict happens. If the real-world feedback is consistent with the virtual feedback, so if I give you a situation in which there's everything that's here, exactly where it should be, plus there's also a dog, a virtual dog, bouncing around on stage, right? Now, obviously, if the dog runs over my leg and I don't feel anything, then it's kind of cool and mysterious. Well, it's, it's less that. That, I think, is, is easier for the mind to rectify. I'm not a neurologist or anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, then, essentially, like, when I, I remember when I first tried the Oculus, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm in, like, a, a battle mech or mm -hmm. whatever, right. and I'm, I'm looking around. Um, but my, and, then, and I'm falling from the sky, uh, but my mind knows that I'm, or sorry, not my mind, my your, body feels the chair. Your vestibular senses also know that your yeah. head is not moving, and so when you are moving, accelerating forward, yeah. virtually, there's no your momentum. Your inner no. ear says, I'm not moving, yeah. you know, that's really, really bad, and well, that's what especially for wide field of view, and yes, you, guys you have your arms like, over <laughs> here, you totally and yet you see the out. virtual yeah. hands moving. That's great. Right. Still yeah. Here? Yeah, so, yeah, so Any other uh, questions here? Yeah, yeah, those, those, are, those sure. are interesting issues. Yeah, to right over here. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, because then they can hear you. Yeah. Uh, Ken, you had mentioned about uh, how the brain has been a constant, that it hasn't uh, changed 
over time? In, in, I mean, obviously, individual brains can change a lot based on cultural influences, but in, ter in evolutionary terms, in natural evolutionary terms, we're starting from the same place uh -huh. that we started from many thousand. Each individual essentially is that they started from tens of thousands of years ago. Okay, because I thought it was uh, maybe worth uh, mentioning a little more about how there could be the behavioral differences. Um, again, the individual perception uh, varies, uh, reactions vary, um, abilities vary. So as far as how people behave in certain situations, um, it can be fascinating as to um, you know how, how that plays out. And therefore, how mm -hmm. augmented reality might moderate those variances in behavior. Sure, and I think that we can say that of any technology, there are people who are going to be great basketball players, great writers, great musicians, you know, but Mozart isn't going to be able to do what Michael Jordan can do and vice versa. And so particular technological advances are going to have specific meanings for uh, some people that they're not going to have for others. And I, but so I, I, my point was that's not something specific to augmented reality. That's something true to all technological advances, but we need to pay attention to it. And there are also differences in training. I mean, you have thousands of years ago and right now in different parts of the world, if you're a little kid, you learn to follow the tracks of an animal, for example. Um, my kids, you know, let them loose in a jungle and they're not going to survive very long. On the other hand, put them in front of an iPhone and their thumbs can do things that some kid who could survive in the jungle wouldn't be able to go and do. You know, so clearly as the technology, as the world changes around us, there'll be abilities that kids will have that in, innately you could argue that they have right now, but they don't exercise, and that people in a very malleable way will learn how to do. Okay, one more question. We could take one more question for the panel. Make it a good one. Somebody must have a burning question that they want to ask. Ask us something we're going to disagree Mark. on. Oh, Mark. Mark. All right, Mark. <laughs> cool. I, I don't want to end on a, on a negative note, but I... <laughs> <laughs> but... but, uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, I mean, we see today that they sounded a little bit like, oh, yeah, so we, we're all aware that holding tablets up in front of objects is not going to work for much longer. And we're all kind of waiting for, for wearables when we really will be able to experience the world in a much more unobtrusive way, a much easier way. Three, four years ago, we had all these tools in place to do wonderful experiences with... Uh, with augmented reality, we had great tracking and we had great SDKs and we had, in my opinion, very little beautiful, beautiful things come out of it except some marketing stunts here and there and, and quite just a few things. So what would be the recommendations on the panel or from the panel to tackle the next wave of innovation so we don't become like self-promoters and maybe more creators and actually create some meaningful, amazing, new, fresh, different things with these technologies as they emerge? What would be some of the strategies to go about? Well, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and this is kind of the last question, I'm fascinated by passive sensors. Um, I have a friend who works with kids with autism and uses the accelerators, uh, accelerometers and phones so that over the course of five or six months can map different uh, behaviors in kids and now is actually getting to the point where they can predict when they're going to have an incident and, and actually create a new form of communication between those parents and those kids. And I think the, the interaction of that type of passive uh, sensor data with the stuff that you can see in augmented means that in one sense we'll be able to almost see the emotional intelligence and the emotional lives of others in ways we never have before. And I think uh, my hope is that there's a sense that like around this room if there's needs that each of us had that we felt comfortable projecting and I mentioned this to you before, that this might sound weird, but this is just one sense of a taxonomy. There might be a color or a hue around you that either sort of, you know, like, I'm lonely today. Uh, if people felt comfortable about that, and in a Starbucks, someone might walk up and give you a cup of coffee. And um, I think that's where the technology, um, I, I do talk a lot about protecting and managing personal data, but I think once that's sort of taken care of, and I hope it can be, I think this is wonderful opportunity for our faces and our bodies through this biometric sensor data um, to not really make a game of our lives, but to more uh, to recognize in one sense how the technology can connect us in a much deeper level. Anyway, that's my closing thought. And done. 
And one thing to mention is that um, there really has been a lot of progress in terms of some of the underlying technologies over the past couple of years. If you try to run certain kinds of applications, certain kinds of SDKs on, let's say, an iPhone from a couple of years ago, it will not run anywhere near the way in which it will run on one from right now, let alone what it will run on from the iPhone 6, or whatever it is that will be called, let alone the next Android phone, etc. And so there's a lot of places in which it doesn't have to be hundreds of times as fast, but just getting a couple of times as fast can play the, can mean the difference between something that runs, let's say, at 10 or 15 hertz versus 30, versus 60, versus 120. And so things that are not even an order of magnitude can make a huge, huge monster difference when they're close enough. You know, and the exciting thing right now is we're close enough that sometimes just a factor of two or three can make the big difference. And as we get better APIs, things that essentially provide the functionality that developers want to have running on devices that are completely commodity devices, that makes it possible to make really, really, really cool things. And then one other thing that really I find very exciting is that there's always people talking about the haves and the have-nots technologically. And the neat thing now is that the same phone that, that the technological haves might have waited online all night long to be able to go and get they now have in the back of the drawer, and you can get that phone for free with any kind of a plan. You can buy the thing unlocked for not very much money, and at some point you'll just manage to go and find them being thrown away. And they're not that much different from the things that are coming out right now. And so, I mean, that notion that it's not like you've got the let them eat cake kind of thing, where you've got people who are incredibly well uh, endowed with amazing amounts of technology, and people who are just literally in the Stone Ages you know, there's, there's less difference, I think, technologically between what the technological haves have and the technologicals don't have. Uh, can I also um, speak to that? Um, by analogy with another um, technology slash cultural influence that I happen to be close to, um, so computer graphics started showing up in the 50s in really the way we think of computer graphics now. And people were doing some stuff in the 60s and there were some, very, very early, like little bits in movies in the late 70s, and then Tron was 1982. But it wasn't until 89 with the one scene, the, the water snake scene in James Cameron's The Abyss, that's like, ah, okay, that actually looks like that's in the same world. Wow, okay. And then, of course, in 1993, the kitchen scene in, um, in um, Jurassic Park, where you can't tell when, which shots is the guy in the rubber suit and is the puppet and is the computer graphics, unless you know. And so, now, when did that happen? There was just a whole bunch of secondary inventions, and as, as Steve says, a whole bunch of stuff getting ready. And then the, the Spielberg or the Cameron could say, okay, I can do my thing with it now. And I think in some level we're getting closer and closer and closer to the Spielberg or the James Cameron of augmented reality, and we don't know exactly what year it's going to hit, but I think we're pretty confident that we're getting closer to that. Great. Thanks so much. We're, we're actually out of time. Sorry, Track. But uh, I do want to thank Stephen Finer, John C. Havens, Track Lord, and Ken Perlin for a great discussion, and thank you so much. <laughs>